So these are my disclosures, and our objectives are going to be dis, uh, to describe some challenges to urinary health following a variety of treatment for your prostate cancer patients. I'll propose some language when you counsel these patients in the office for how treatment might affect them and then to encourage them on the recovery pathway, and then go over some treatment algorithms for a relevant pathology. So in terms of preparing the patient, make sure to have the discussion and to document it. The way I like to explain it to patients if they're sent to me in advance, and I direct men's health. I don't do primary prostate uh, cancer therapy, but I have a lot of providers in my group that do. So I explain that the prostate is a gland that's involved with both urinary and sexual health, and when you remove a lethal cancer to preserve life involving the prostate, that can pose challenges to those functions. I explain that even if the operation or the delivery of radiation is done the same way every time, patients are all unique in their ability to heal. Uh, most people will recover urinary control, a little bit different than sexual function, but explaining that there's a comprehensive team already in place. So even if natural healing is incomplete, in addition to providing effective cancer therapy, people are there with a vested interest to restore urinary and sexual health. The challenges, uh, challenges to these patients will vary by the treatment modality. We're all well familiar with the outcomes following uh, surgical therapy. You can see stress incontinence, development of contractures in some patients. In terms of radiation, there's hemorrhagic cystitis, uh, irritative lower urinary tract symptoms, either from urgency or reduced bladder capacity. And you can even see secondary bladder cancer, which can present with both of those things, right? Bleeding and irritative symptoms. I'll see men referred to me after salvage cryotherapy or after TERP following a, a, another primary therapy, I'll, whether it be cryo, uh, external beam, or brachytherapy. And you can still see stress incontinence. Uh, other things you can see can be very problematic. I don't feel that dystrophic calcifications, even though they're seen by a lot of us, get enough press in the literature on how to effectively deal with them because they're very challenging. And depending on how these patients are being managed, you can see fistulas extending anteriorly to the pubic symphysis from the prosthetic urethra, sometimes presenting as chronic pain uh, from osteomyelitis or inferiorly from rectal urethral fistula, which is why you have to be very careful in your resection techniques if you're going in there for contractures, for example, or for these calcifications, and why you should probably avoid uh, aggressive, blind uh, sound dilation of the urethra when these patients can't uh, receive a catheter. So in terms of counseling patients, so again, emphasizing the positivity that most patients will recover and that recovery is an ongoing process, typically at least for the first year, encouraging them to be patient, to watch for that. And so I usually suggest that patients for the first 90 days after surgery should be put in touch with a pelvic floor physical therapist if you can find one in your area and have a more structured program rather than simply describing Kegel exercises. Um, if significant issues persist in six months, we tell them we have a team member specializing in optimizing their urinary health and to facilitate and accelerate recovery. And the same is true if they have any or any bothersome stress incontinence at a year. So the AUA and SUFU published a, a joint guideline, and so I, I picked out the key components as I saw them. Informed consent is obvious, but they had mentioned including climacteria. I'll be honest, I don't have that discussion with most patients. I find that a lot of what they deem to be climacteria might just be motion-related stress incontinence during sexual activity, but it is a real uh, complaint for some people. Pelvic floor exercises are described both before and after surgery. So that's something uh, interesting in that guideline. They do recommend cystoscopy before you operate for stress incontinence, whether it be for slings or sphincters. Urodynamics are mandatory, but they can be um, ordered at physician discretion. When placing an artificial sphincter, the single perineal cuff is preferred as opposed to the penis scrotal approach or using tandem cuffs. Um, Proact is an option. It uh, looks to be gaining popularity in select centers. AUS is still the gold standard, however, for radiated patients. Slings are not uh, quite as successful in that group. Bulking agents are unlikely to help. I know that some people still use these and feel like they want to kind of bridge the gap for a little bit until they decide to do something more, but patients should be informed. And the rest of this guideline is pretty much common sense if you take the time to look it over. In terms of management surgically for male stress incontinence, we still talk about slings and sphincters most commonly. Uh, sling candidates tend to have more milder uh, to moderate incontinence compared to your AUS candidates. And then you want to see if they can still voluntarily co op their sphincter to some degree on a preoperative clinic cysto, and you want to be able to get past the bladder neck. Same is true for artificial urinary sphincter candidates. But in addition, you want to make sure that they have the cognition and the dexterity to use the device adequately. In counseling patients sent to me for bladder neck contractures, most of the time when they come to me, it's because they've had refractory uh, situations. But I explained to the patient that the area where the prostate's been removed and your urinary tract restored is scarred down. It's narrowed the passage for urine. And urinary control seems to be getting better 
but it's better for the wrong reason or what I call pathologic continence, okay? And so that could risk retention. So you have to kind of explain it before you intervene, especially when they have to be prepared that their stress incontinence may get worse. I explained that the scar needs to be widened to protect their ability to empty. So when people ask, well, how do you approach these? I think that the majority of bladder neck contractures are typically managed quite well with one or two uh, simple endourethral procedures. Could be dilation, could be DVIU, either with a uh, urethrotome or you can use what we call a hot knife, Collins knife, laser. Uh, Transurethral resection with injection is an option up front uh, that is more popular, especially for recurrent lesions. Um, and then for considering to uh, offering surgery for correction of stress incontinence after the fact, you want to see that that bladder neck is stable. Some people will uh, go in as soon as six weeks. I typically wait three months. If you have patients that have been refractory to multiple, multiple procedures, okay, options are intermittent self-dilation, um, restraint cath, indoling catheters, simple diversion with a suprapubic tube, complex diversion, or as like University of Colorado, Dr. Flynn will occasionally entertain redoing the anastomosis, which is a complex procedure. Hemorrhagic cystitis, again, I explained to patients that radiation is unfortunately the gift that can keep on giving, has long-term effects not only on the lining of the bladder, but on the blood flow to the area, it can complicate healing, and so you can see blood in the urine. Recent data suggests the incidence is about 11% after radiation therapy, and uh, for patients that are affected, the rate of transfusion is quite high. So in terms of management, uh, if you're not seeing this in practice, I know I'm shielded from this by resident coverage in a lot of situations, but I remember being a resident and having to do these irrigations and go in to coagulate. Uh, we did installation a fair bit when I was in training about you know, 12, 13 years ago, um, alum, amicar. Some of these other ones uh, have been uh, evidenced and uh, are used at select centers. Hyperbaric oxygen is not something everyone has access to, but if you do, we have new randomized data showing that this is an effective therapy, um, both subjectively and objectively, and the sooner you treat these patients, the better. It's a, typically about a 40 treatment regimen, and each treatment's 90 minutes, so it's not a short-term commitment, okay? And there are toxicities that are possible, but it can also be beneficial for radiation proctitis, and the cost is not really cheap. There are rare reports describing success with embolization for hemorrhagic cystitis, uh, but again, I would not say that that has a strong amount of evidence behind it. Some people will try to divert with just nephrostomy tubes, but occasionally these patients will need a uh, formal diversion. Uh, there are a variety of other oral and IV agents that have been described and are listed there. In terms of their irritative symptoms, okay, um, patients are well uh, familiar with OAB just from the commercials for uh, pharmaceuticals, okay, and you kind of explain that they're similar symptoms here, and they can be due to their radiation damage. So you can have less bladder capacity, you can have higher urgency, and you might even have chronic discomfort. And the treatment's very much the same, right, in terms of what we offer medically. They even describe some success from pelvic floor, and you might think, well, that seems like it would only be beneficial for stress incontinence, but it has been shown to be beneficial in this arena as well. Azo, there's some uh, data now showing safety for using phenazopyridine for longer periods of time, cranberry tablets, uh, but always remember to consider the possibility of a secondary bladder cancer in these patients. We're not, we don't have the data to know if hyperbaric oxygen is also effective just when they have these lower urinary symptoms, but it's a potential. Leukocytes are a common finding in the urine for these patients, but it doesn't necessarily mean infection. So some patients might be subjected to courses of antibiotics that they don't need. There may be a role for next generation sequencing in those patients, and you'll hear more about that later. For brachytherapy patients, it may take years to go back to normal symptom scores, and that can be even uh, more prolonged if they're getting external beam or they had problems at baseline. Distrosa calcifications I mentioned, just be careful when you go in and you see this dirty cotton appearance or this necrotic fluff uh, and do just the minimum necessary, but it can be a nidus for persistent infection. So in terms of conclusions, urinary issues after treatment for prostate cancer are common across a variety of uh, modalities and patients should be counseled in advance. After surgery, most patients will recover continence, so emphasize the positive to them and they should know that help is available should their healing be suboptimal. OAB type symptoms can occur after surgery, but more so with radiation, and these patients should be screened and treated. Fortunately, hemorrhagic cystitis is rare, but unfortunately when it occurs, it can be severe, and pay, a provider should be informed uh, and have access to available treatment options. Thank you.